Hi, William. I'm so happy to see you again. I haven't had a chance to chat with William Henry in uh, probably about a year now, although we did run into each other at a conference recently, speaking about transhumanism and the rainbow body of humankind. And today we're going to get into it a little further because I really kind of have a bug about this one, the transhuman movement. And right. William probably explains it in a more nuanced way than I think anybody else out there. So with that, William, great to see you again. Wonderful to see you too, Regina. Thank you so much. Great to talk with you. You know, when I said I have a bug about this particular one, you know, it's that there's so much money, so much advanced technology, so much put into the whole notion of trying to extend human life, right? right. Physically, without ever taking time to understand the mechanism of the spirit and the soul and our immortality in a very natural, organic way. And before we even get going, I have to ask you this. Did you see the movie Get Out? No, I haven't seen Get Out. Oh, you got to see it. It's a wonderful black comedy. It's just, it's just fabulous. Uh, uh, Keenan Peele, it's really beautiful. On, it's basically on the subject of transhumanism. That's a little bit of a spoiler alert, but it's kind of taken it mainstream and it's getting tons of accolades. And I think it just came up on Netflix. You okay. might have... Yeah, you might have fun just watching it in a pop sense. You're doing the elegant version. This is like the down-home version of transhumanism. <laughs> <laughs> but William, um, let's talk a little bit about the psyche involved in the people who are going to this extent and draining so many resources to try to get an immortality through a physical body. Well, you have to remember, in large part, we're talking about Silicon Valley types, your engineers, they're, they're very incredibly bright people, super intelligent with the greatest tools ever known to man at their disposal. And I, probably their intention is in the right place. They want to see humankind advance. Their, their basic starting principle is that our body is, is way too fragile. In fact, it's kind of poorly designed by whoever created or fashioned the body and it needs some tweaking. And so that what they are proposing is that we can go in the body with, with new technologies, put in replacement organs, artificial organs. We can enhance our consciousness through uh, merging our consciousness with artificial intelligence to create a, a new super being. The, the ultimate goal of, of this process is that the word that they actually use in Silicon Valley is the word perfection. They, they are seeking to perfect the human body. And what's really interesting about that is that, of course, that is the, the, the aspiration of many spiritual traditions as well. Going back into the Jewish mystical tradition, the Buddhist tradition, and others, they, they sought to, to perfect the body in the spiritual sense, not by merging it with machines or with uh, artificial intelligence. You know, it, and it's a very nuanced conversation because who among us, given an option, wouldn't say, yeah, I could use some of that because my liver's worn out and I'm not in line for a liver transplant and it looks like they can just kind of build one from scratch um, or certainly upgrade mine. So it starts slipping into our psyche in ways that are very natural, just a natural extension of technology, medical technology available, but there's more to it. That's right, because ultimately the danger of any of this technology, once it breaks the skin barrier, is that it also breaks the free will barrier as well. Uh, another good example is this, this quest that they have to develop the new contact lenses that will be loaded with, with cameras and with electronics so that we can record everything and we're wired to, to the internet 24-7 giving us supervision, literal supervision, ability to see in the dark, infrared, and so forth. But the problem is, is that with supervision comes supervision. And this is where we have to really take a hard look at this about what are the spiritual implications or the, the soul-based implications for this technology. It's wonderful to prolong our life. I mean, life is precious, and we're very lucky to be embodied as souls. We're very lucky to be embodied in a physical body to work out karma to to learn spiritual lessons and so forth and we definitely are charged with preserving our body and maintaining it but there's a line that we cross and that one of the terms that they use uh, in Silicon Valley is that we enter in what's called creepy valley and this is where the machines that we're making the robots that we're, we're making look too human and it just creeps us out 
Well, there's also a sense from the soul perspective that there's a, there's this line where you can enhance yourself through supplements, through meditation, through augmentation, but there's a point where we, it gets too creepy and each individual has to figure out where they're, they're at for themselves on that, on that line. But the fact is, is that it's very real and more and more they're, they're coming at us with this technology, not in a, in a sense that we really want to choose to do this, but in fact, it's going to be mandated. And of course, we've talked a lot about chipping in the past, and most everybody's already chipped. They just don't realize it. You know, they're carrying one of those debit cards that's already got the chip in it. They're carrying a cell phone that is, makes them trackable, and, and every thought, every keystroke that they have on that phone is recorded. So we're already being augmented in this way. They just haven't broken the skin barrier yet. And once the skin barrier is broken, that's when the soul barrier is broken as well. Yeah, and that's the real key to it. I've noticed when I did my original research into transhumanism a few years ago, there was a site that's been scrubbed. It doesn't look the same anymore. It was out of MIT. Basic, well, essentially, most of the participants and scientists involved were out of MIT. Mm -hmm. And the site was called intelligence.org. I think mm -hmm. if you go there now, it doesn't look anything like it used to. But you used to be able to look into the background of the people that are the real movers and shakers from the scientific end around this technology. And there seems to be uh, a consensus, not a consensus, but a prevailing pattern of atheism. Just really Absolutely. simple atheism. And I know I mentioned this in the conference and people are like, oops, she shouldn't have said that. But right. the reality is, if you do not believe that you have anything that transcends the physical, why wouldn't you be looking in every direction to extend the life of the physical, right? That's absolutely right. There's, when you don't have a belief in an eternal life or reincarnation or a continued existence, you are going to want to uh, augment the physical body to preserve your, your existence as long as you can. And you're also going to take the perspective that the contents of your brain equals the contents of your soul. They're the same thing. And that simply by uploading the contents of your brain, you're actually uploading what spiritual people would think of as the soul and therefore it continues on and it doesn't matter if it's in this container or if it's in a, a, a like a facebook avatar container you know facebook spaces is now trying to get everybody to create cartoon versions of themselves and upload all their photos into this cartoon version and that that is a form of digital immortality that's what they're ultimately selling and one of the ultimate scary aims of all this is they're going to be trying to convince us to drop our physical bodies altogether and exist in this simulated reality. And that's coming right around the bend here within three to five years. You know, um, just to validate that from, this is secondhand, so we have to label it as hearsay. But a woman that attended one of my conferences spoke about this to the group, and she, it was toward the end. She said, it's really creepy. She quit her job. She was a caterer in Silicon Valley. So, mm. you know, it was a pretty innocuous position, you would think. But she was catering for events that appeared to be panels of individual corporations that were dealing with transhumanism. And she said she started figuring it out because of some really simple, <laughs> okay, this is part of the creepy story, right? She started noticing that you had these people there that were essentially flawless human beings. Mm -hmm. They didn't look like normal people, just in that they almost look like a mannequin version of people. They, right. Especially the women, a lot of these mannequin-like versions of human beings. The other thing she said is they had X number of people attending the event, but actually served almost no food at the event. It appeared there were certain of the people involved that ate food, and the rest of them, especially the really attractive ones, uh -huh. did not eat any food. And it wasn't just because they were fashion models and they were anorexic. <laughs> And in addition, she did come across some other evidence in terms of uh, a, ta a sheet of talking points. They were talking about how do transhumanists, how do these new beings start blending in society as to be de uh, become undetectable, for example. And there were a whole list of these kind of not so much ethical but problematic um, points that were being made apparently during this conference and what she saw literally just on a on a sheet that had been left behind as talking points. And she didn't seem to be spinning a tall one. She was actually quite frightening to her, which is why she ended up quitting a very lucrative job. So what do you say about that? That's now. She said, it's already here. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that, that this is the, the blend or the blur time that we're in, where it's going to be coming so hard and so fast that we, we won't have 
you know, a real solid footing to go by. And I mean, look how quickly this, the, the transgender concept has, has taken hold. That all of a sudden, within the past five years, we, we see this, this, this not really a movement, but a whole group of people who are identifying themselves in a different way than, than others before. And it's, the next step is, is not just the transgender, but it is the transhuman movement where we're going to be seeing non-biological entities, robots, more and more in our midst, as well as humans who have blurred the line between human and machine. And it is, it's creepy, it's as creepy as it gets. And maybe this is the way that, that humanity is supposed to progress, but a lot of people are, have their, their grave reservations, and I'm certainly one of them, just saying we've got to put the brakes on here and we have to have some kind of a, a conversation about the, 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 just the, the prevalence of artificial intelligence in our world and the assumption by especially the global elite that this is the direction humanity must go in order to save itself. And, and that's what we, so it's coming from the top down when you've got the United Nations and everybody on down saying that this is practically a mandate that they have to do this. That's not exactly true. Most people are simply not aware of the accelerated pace of the technology and just how subversive it ultimately can be. Absolutely. And, and fortunately, there are a few brave, high-profile souls that are really coming out against us. I mean, Elon Musk, as the most notable, saying, you know, he is in, he is, his entire being is devoted to the advancement of technology that serves civilization, human civilization. He said this absolutely has to be stopped. This is where we start crossing the line now. And, you know, when you look at it, even, even from a simple point of view, for example, how does it work when you have an undetectable transhuman having sex with, mating with a human? Right. Well, what happens to, what is happening in terms of the DNA? I mean, the implications of this are huge. Talk about immediately corrupted DNA strands. Has anyone done any work on looking at it from a, that point of view, a pure mating of the two? No, not that I'm aware of, but what you are seeing is in the, like, especially in the EU is the clearing away for transhumans as well as robots to have equal rights as humans. Of course, transhumans should because they are bio, partly biological beings or mostly biological beings. But when they're clearing the way for robots to have rights and treating them as citizens, you clearly see that this is a movement away from the biological to either post-biological or non-biological entities as the, as the norm and the biological entity fading away. And that's where it gets really scary because you don't know what if, if the if the top down plan is is to merge us with machines, and, they, and it's very openly discussed that the machines may or may not like us. Then what is going to be the outcome when the machines ultimately do take over? You know, will it be as people often discuss a Terminator type scenario, a Matrix type scenario? All of these are very valid possibilities for for what's coming up uh, on down the road very quickly. Indeed, and it's really, it still has to require our participation. And the point is, we do have sovereignty in that way. And the, the, the thing that I keep going back to is, um, it's just down to education, to understanding we're more than this body, which right. this world of science seems slow to embrace, but there are those within science who are embracing it. This incredible matrix, the pineal gland, all of the master glands in the body, the way in which our body can draw down from the field, from the cosmos, the most refined understandings and energy, which is really where your work really starts picking up. And I'd like you to go ahead and just talk about not only that, but how historically our um, ancient and evolved, the evolved of our ancestors we're fully aware of this and they laid down clues for us to find our way back to it and hopefully clues that science can ultimately pick up on, not just people who are developing consciously. Right. Well, in every spiritual tradition throughout history, at least for the past 5,000 years, you have this quest for, for transcendence, this idea that our flesh ha can be transformed and indeed should be transformed, spiritually speaking. And again, this is where the their transhumanists take this and say, well, we're going to do this, not spiritually, but through technology. 
And the, the uniting factor in all the world's spiritual traditions is that humans are in a transition phase, that we are not meant to fully identify with our body as it is, but rather to identify it as an, in its ascended or its even resurrected state. So there's always been this quest for, for transcendence of the flesh and an agreement that we can do this spiritually. And so it doesn't matter, again, if you're talking the Jewish mystery tradition, the Christian mystery tradition, Egyptian, Tibetan, they all say the same thing, that the only way to, to truly perfect the human body is through love, through compassion, and through unity with our divine selves. And this is what is, again, contrary to the transhumanist uh, vision where it's all going to be technology and there's nothing spiritual about it whatsoever. And somehow the two have to, there, there has to be a meeting of the mind somewhere because we're clearly not going to just eliminate this technology. And hopefully the technologists won't eliminate our spirituality either, although that could be a possibility as well. So right now is the time when this conversation has to be had. We have to have Elon Musk and the Dalai Lama sitting at the same table talking with all the Silicon Valley transhumanist types, really working this out and, and educating the, the, the general public about what is possible for us right now and the two paths that are before us so that individuals can make the choice that will ultimately be the right one for their, for their soul's growth, which I'm sure for most people is not going to be going down the technological route. No, I don't think so. Your presentations are absolutely beautiful. And, you know, it's interesting because when you do this, you, you come in on the ray of what's happening now, modern culture, and really what the threat is. And, and I agree with you. I perceive it as a very genuine threat. Mm -hmm. um, if we're not made aware of what is at stake, something mm -hmm. that will continue progressing. And oddly, there just aren't that many people that are out there talking about it in terms of the spiritual implications, the corruption of DNA, et cetera. I mean, we have a lot of people, a lot of sites devoted to transhumanism. We have a lot of movies devoted to it. But interestingly, very seldom do they actually look at the implication of what that means to the human being. No. How is what you're doing so completely different and radical from that? Well, again, I start from the, the soul's perspective and looking at it from the point of view that our, our body is a, is a spiritual tool in a sense, and it's not something that is meant to be treated as a computer. I think we kind of went off track when we started thinking of the brain as a biocomputer and the, and, the, and the body as a transformational apparatus. When we start thinking of the body as a machine, we, we want to treat it like a machine. And what we have to get back to is this organic understanding that we're, we're part of the earth, we're part of the cosmos, and that, in fact, by creating these machines and turning ourselves into machines, we're actually severing our tie with our spiritual roots. And that's, that's the starting place. The other place I, I start from is just this basic understanding that humans in our, in our core are actually light beings and that we have to nurture our true and divine self. And of course, that's the foundation of, of Buddhism. We have to tap back into our divine nature, our original nature, because in the, in the Buddhist tradition, everything we see out here, all of this is illusion and, and suffering. And indeed it is. And, we're, and, and my concern is that with the transhumanism, that this will further enmesh or enfold or entrap us in greater suffering. It won't release us from... Uh, the, the pain of earth life, as they say, that it, it will only prolong the pain, in my opinion. I mean, I agree with you 100%. And it's seeming more imperative than ever to me, you know, I'm, I'm kind of, I research everything. That's my job, right? Go to conferences, listen to it. Just came back from, you know, uh, Starworks USA, the former uh, International UFO Congress a couple of days ago. Uh -huh. And it's interesting because as fascinating as all of these pieces are, they're all pieces. They're all like a tile and a mosaic of the picture right. of what the human, not only our human history, but our human potential and future looks like. Yeah. I'm watching all these really good, just dozens and dozens of UFO sightings, fascinating, genuine UFO sightings, particularly in the country of Turkey, they're really on board with it. But all over the world, yet I'm thinking, so what now? Now I'm starting to think, so what? We know that, they've been here from the beginning, yeah. right? Right. And yet, what really seems to matter the most to me 
is using this matrix that we already have built in to start using our own divine intelligence. This is our planet. Right. So whatever else is coming to help, assist, interfere with, it's, our, it's the human being's planet. Right. What do you think? Um, well, I agree. And part of this is, you know, once we tap this, as I refer to it, ascension intelligence, then we're, we're tapping into the realms of those, hopefully the, the more divine extraterrestrials that are coming here, the angelic type beings that all the world spiritual traditions speak of. So, you know, the, the danger is, at least as I see it, is that when you're, when you're talking especially about extraterrestrials, they, they would have had to have encountered the same laws of physics that we encounter. The Bible says that flesh and blood can't inherit the kingdom of heaven. That means the, the extraterrestrials that are piloting those ships must either be in one of two forms. They're either robots, they're transhumans themselves, or they're in some kind of a light body or light being form. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it seems to me it's one or the other. I'm, I'm not of the opinion that we're going to be encountering flesh and blood humanoid type beings in these craft. And so th this, again points the, the, the challenge or the choice that's before us. Are we, are we thinking that we're going to be meeting extraterrestrials that are flesh and blood beings like us? Or is it more going to be the reality that we're going to be meeting robots that have been sent here from distant star systems? Or we're going to be encountering light beings? And again, in my, my path is to, to follow the path that they're actually light beings that we want to more closely follow rather than the advanced technological beings who are more than likely uh, transhumans or robots. That's what um, one of the uh, talks that Paula Harris did. Um, she's also organizer of the conference. She uh -huh. did a talk on that. Lieutenant Colonel Corso, I mean, Colonel Corso, um, believed that they were created biological entities. They were EBEs, as he called them, which right. were more or less drones to do a job. But that gets me into really a, a, a question that is a bit of a conundrum. You know how in so many uh, bodies of work, they speak about how in the beginning, whether it's uh, Zechariah Sitchin and the Anunnaki or all the way to the, the story I tell about the origins, a slightly different spin on all of that and everything in between, is mm -hmm. that human beings, the original human beings here, probably were worked with. There probably was genetic modification right. with human beings here, certainly with the electrical system of the body and so forth. Well, that opens up the question, is it possible they can create these part human, part synthetic bodies and have it actually capable of housing a soul, even though no. theoretically you think that complex of glands and such simply can't exist in the same way. Yeah, I mean, that's, that, that gets us back to the question of why did they come here? Of course, we've already, we've long ago dismissed the Zachariah Sitchin, they came here for gold theory. It's clear their, their interest is more heavily influenced or, or focused on souls. And if they did augment the body, I think it's very possible that they did. For what purpose? In my right. view, the, the evidence shows they augmented the body to make it a more conducive vehicle for the ascension of the soul. And there is something about the way our body works that makes it a, a better vehicle for, for spiritual activation, for, for ascension. And the question is, is can a transhuman ascend is, is ultimately where the, the conversation goes. If you're talking about a, a robotic entity that is, or a, a non-biological entity that's trying to make us over into their image and turn us into machines, can a, can a soul utilize a machine body to ascend? At, at the moment, we don't have any evidence that that's possible. I mean, the door is, is certainly open that, that that could be a possibility, but there is something all the world's spiritual traditions agree truly uh, divine or spiritual about the human body. And that's why I think we want to leave it the way it is for now until we have better evidence that augmenting it is actually going to assist us in our spiritual lives. Here, here. And also I, another interesting point I've come across several times over the last few years of research is that throughout the cosmos, this human form is the most preferred form. It seems to have a degree of high function that can interface with many degrees of awareness and consciousness and intelligence. Mm -hmm. So again, why would we why would we tinker with that if it's already been so beautifully designed to begin with as to be able to do all these things without uh, the assistance of technology? Right. Right? And let's talk about uh, let's talk about what you do in your conferences. Um, 
because I know what you do in your talks, but what do you do in your conferences in terms of helping people hook up to this aspect of themselves that they may be kind of cut off from at present or unaware of to an extent? Well, what Claire and I have been developing these past few years is that we, we call our, our workshop the Sacred Art of Ascension. And what we've been doing is collecting hundreds of images, of many of them art masterpieces from the Renaissance and other periods that show visually the ascended human being. And we link that with current neuroscience that shows that as we look at these images and interact with them, actually our mirror neurons and our neocortex are firing as if we are having that ascension experience. And so we put these two pieces together, the neuroscience and the art, to say, here is a modality. Again, from, from Buddhism, from the Egyptian tradition, early Christians all talked about the power of an image to show us the way to our higher selves, towards our higher divinity, toward our ascended selves. So taking these traditions that face value, we've gone about collecting these hundreds of images from, Buddhist, from the Buddhist tradition, Christian, Egyptian, and other traditions that show, and the Tibetan, of course, that show the ascended human, the, the, the light being within us. And by connecting with it mentally, physically, spiritually, and emotionally, we're activating that aspect of ourselves and actually providing a, another modality for ascension. Absolutely. Hey, I have a favor to ask. Um, can we just go ahead at the very end of this conversation here and just put up a couple of those, your favorite ascension images Absolutely. so people can just take some time to do a freeze frame and meditate on them and really open up your entire being and feel the chemical reactions, feel where the energy is moving in your body. I would love to be able to do that. Yeah, absolutely. And the key to it is really fascinating. And that's the, the reason why it can work. If you're looking at a, an image of, say, White Tara or the Buddha or Padmasambhava, who, who taught the, the rainbow body or even Osiris and others, all of these spiritual traditions say the same thing, that these are super high frequency avatar type beings who can transmit their vibration through images. And once you accept that, the, the sky's the limit in terms of interacting with these, these advanced beings through these images. You know, one of my favorite examples, and I'll show you that as well, is uh, coming from the Buddhist tradition. They're called welcoming descent paintings. They show the, the Buddha of infinite light descending from the celestial realms on a cloud to welcome a, an ascending soul. A, a, a Buddhist uh, devotee for, in this scenario would be dying and they would hang these paintings on the wall beside their bed. And then they would tie a silken cord to the painting. And the belief was, and what they were taught is that the, the soul, when it left its body, could enter into the pure land where the Buddha of infinite light came from through the painting. Now think about that. I mean, what kind of a universe do we live in when a soul can ascend into the pure land through a painting, or when a divine being or an avatar can transmit their holy vibration through a painting. To me, it's a very beautiful universe that we live in when it can be that simple. That simple. <laughs> it is to me too, and I'm, I'm on your path, I'm with you. Um, you have another workshop coming up soon, I think it's uh, this weekend, what's that, November 17th, 18th? In Sedona, right? Yeah, that's right, so we're right. gonna be talking cool. Friday night about the, the transhuman timeline and what's coming up, all of the, the, the incredible developments that are happening, how things are accelerating as we move towards the singularity here in the, with probably within the next 10 years. And then on Saturday during the workshop, we'll be doing the Art of Ascension, which will be a, just an immersion in hundreds of examples of sacred art and an exploration of the neuroscience that backs it up and then practical uh, insights and, and action steps that you can take to carry this on into your into your personal ascension plan. Well, if that doesn't make you high as a kite before you leave, <laughs> I'll go. although I have to say, because I just love the energy of both you and your wife, Claire, you guys have such sparkly, clean, beautiful, loving energy. I guess between all the images and you two, you know, stirring the pot, it should be a, quite a high for everyone that does attend. So I wish you luck on that event. And meanwhile, what's coming up next? What are you working on now? Well, I'm finishing a book about the Essenes, uh, which I hope to have out in early 2018, the, 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 what the Dead Sea Scrolls teach us about ascension. I'm always writing articles for my website, williamhenry.net, trying to keep everybody up to speed on art advancements in artificial intelligence. 
Uh, we're leading a tour to Egypt in February, and we just got back from Lourdes, uh, which was an extraordinary healing experience. I mean, just absolutely mind-blowing. We're getting ready to go back to Lourdes in May. Sounds absolutely wonderful, William. I really appreciate your taking a little bit of time to be with me on my new site, and I'm inviting all my favorite people and friends back on, and once you get that book done in 2018, the one about the Essenes, why don't we get back and do this again? Absolutely love it. Thank you, Regina. Thank you so much. Thank you so much again, WilliamHenry.net, for all of your body of work and the weekend coming up. So thanks again. Pleasure. God bless.